I'm not responsive too well to emails. Um, I, uh, that's why Bao had that fucked up bio. <laughs> because that was the bio back when I was trying to get a job. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> then I decided, well, I'm just going to work for myself. And I don't know why that's still on the internet, but you know, whatever. It's a moment in time. It's a Polaroid, right? Yeah. Um, I just came from a place called uh, Gathering Nations Power. Oh. It's a huge power. And it's, it's a really cool spectacle. So it's a spectacle because there's about 50,000 people, 50,000 natives, and then there's a whole bunch of white folks that want to come and see the natives act native, and so the natives act super native, more native than they were. <laughs> On a regular basis, we're not dressing like that shit. <laughs> but it's beautiful because it's about the womanly spirit. Our Mother's Day is next week, right? So buy your mom something. You guys are fortunate enough to have mom, grandma. My grandmother passed this last year. This, type of, this time of year, this life-giving time of year, is the motherly time. It's life-giving time. And power is all about that, the circle. It's a motherly, it's a feminine symbol. It's about life. It's about love. And I like to write about, I was raised by a single mother and two older sisters, so I had three moms in a real bad Oedipus complex. <laughs> I breastfed till I was about 12. <laughs> That's how I got so big. <laughs> and, and I still do on occasion. <laughs> Me and my son, we used to fight, you know. Um, but, <laughs> I like to write about unabashed native love. That's something that you don't read about. People of color, we don't write, we write about anger, and, we, and all that stuff is perfectly valid. We write about politics, we write about discipline, we write about success, we don't write about love. We have forms of love that other people, dominant culture cannot experience because they not, have not experienced the level of suffering that we have. And you cannot truly love until you've suffered. And so this first poem is called Miss Lady. The actual name is called Aki. I was playing around with my language, which is the Blackfoot language, Apskapi Bagani. And you guys might not understand some of the words, but hopefully the context tells what it is. It's called Miss Lady, and it's a love story. It starts off. Miss Lady, Miss Lady, can I say this to you? OK. <laughs> Miss Lady, Miss Lady, do you believe in love at first sight? Yes. Or should I walk by again? No. <laughs> love at first sight. <laughs> That's right. No, truly, Miss Indigenous, I've been feeling your vibe since time immemorial, long before we were known as tribes or Native Americans or Indians or any of these other lies that we subscribe to that denies yours and my true legacy as the original nitsitapi of this psychum. What I'm trying to say, Miss Lady, is this really isn't first sight. In fact, Ninsta, I've been scoping you since you first gave birth to this earth, this land, breastfed me with your flowing water, shaped the mountains with your hands, the matriarch of this continent. Earth, wind, and fire at your command. Lifespan is eternal, hourglass turns sideways, no movement to your sand. Beauty and class are internal, no movement to your sand. What I'm trying to say, Miss Lady, is, girl, you look good for your age. <laughs> no movement to your sand, though I know your life hasn't been a beach. There had to be problems before the first Napiquan landed on your beach, but now I find myself calling you bitch, acquired his profanity in my speech, breached your confidence in my manhood, leave my young ones for you to teach, and I know you're a bad woman, ma. There's just some things you can't teach, and you shouldn't have to. What I'm trying to say, Miss Lady, is that I'm sorry. 
Because now when I see you with somebody who's not Nitsitapi, I feel a sense of shame. I provided you with every excuse, Miss Lady. I know I'm mostly to blame. Desecrated your royalty, yet you were loyal. I can't say the same. Waited in vain for my love. Of course it never came. Provided me with gentle reminders of your blind affection each and every time that it rained. Ignored for centuries. Needed a way to hide your frustration and your pain. I guess what I'm saying is that I understand. But I'm begging for understanding too, Miss Lady. I'm trying to be that Nina, that man that I should have been since long before time was called time. Before husband and wife, I was simply yours and you were simply mine. I did not have to try to act as a man, rather just walked in the way that Obstadalki had designed. I think I could do that again, Miss Lady. So I guess what I'm saying is, girl, can I have your phone number? <laughs> yeah. Um, this, this second piece is about another one of my loves, hip hop. Hip hop had a profound influence on my life. I'm, I was raised on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, which is a place of about, um, you know, the, the numbers constantly rising. The official count is about 1,500 people, but we're very prolific. We breed well. And, and so by this time, there's probably about 4,000 that live in that small town. It's a place of about 70% unemployment, and it's very, very underdeveloped resources very poor place. And um, it's an odd place to discover the spectacle of hip hop because everything gets there. We didn't have cable when I was a little kid. And so it was a, it was a place where you didn't see stuff. The trends were really, really, really late for me. And I used to you know, go to powwows and I'd get beat up for being involved with hip hop, for loving hip hop. But it's had a profound influence on my life. It's guided me and it's been a constant companion to me just in the same way that the love affair with any particular person has, a best friend. And so this is just simply called hip hop. And I might have to refer to the text in here because I haven't looked at this in a while, but it's simply called hip hop. Back, I'm gonna take you back. Back when hip hop was called rap. Back when Michael Jack was black. Back before crack hit the streets, Tootie and Blair were teaching me life's facts. <laughs> I had long braids and strong grades. Education was going to be my way. Off the reservation, change my situation. I promised that I'm going to buy my mom a house someday. See, our pinto was red, eating government cheese and reading comics, playing freeze tag in ripped pro wings and tracks, impoverished by Reaganomics. This was third world USA. The land that time forgot. The land that fashion and rhyme forgot to this day. Country music and wranglers are still hot. It's not urban. It's a true story. <laughs> it's not urban or street at all. Ghetto is all get out, but it's still not hood. In fact, many of our streets aren't even paved. Country boy represented, but it's still all good. Even when it was all bad. Those welfare years were the best good times and bad times that I've ever had because that was home. And oddly enough, the place that I discovered hip hop. See, just like everybody else, I watched Beat Street 20 million times. I was mesmerized by the diddy bop. I memorized all the rhymes. Beat Street, the king of the beat. I see you rocking that beat from across the street. You guys remember that? B Street is a lesson too because of, you can't let the streets beat you. And the streets didn't beat me. But them older kids beat me. And they beat me and they beat me into the unpaved street. See, I was doing something different. And that just wasn't cool. Bandanas on my arms and knees. Banana seed on my bike. I'd speed and kick corny rhymes to myself on the way to school. Native kid breakdancing in the wall. This was years before I discovered girls are ball. I had the fake Michael Jackson glove glitter and all. <laughs> Kmart sweatsuit tutting against the wall, you guys know the tut? <laughs> and just for you young folks in here, for you young folks in here, just a note about Michael Jackson. I feel sorry for you guys that only got to see Michael in his old, decrepit, broke down, no na nose face. Michael was that cool. Michael was that dude. Excuse me why I digress. This isn't really part of the poem, but people like to say Michael was weird and he was gay and all this stuff. But that didn't stop any one of us from wanting to know him. Shit, I had the fake Michael Jackson jacket. The one where the zippers didn't zip. And I studied all his movements. 
Even the way he stuck out his lip because Michael was hip hop. And Turbo dancing with the magic broomstick was hip hop. And Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick was hip hop. And your broken down Atari Joy stick was hip hop. And Jerry Curls was hip hop. Yeah. And Jelly Sandals on Dusty Little Ass Reservation Girls was hip hop. <laughs> because being poor was hip hop. Quarter water and penny candy from the corner store was hip hop. And we all did that from the metropolis to the boondocks, New York City to the reservation. Hip hop was poor people's telephone when ours at home got cut off, no ringtone, and we didn't want to feel alone, so we spoke to each other through the only universal languages that we knew, poverty and music, hip hop. How am I doing on time? Uh, we'll do that, 10 okay, I'm gonna do one and it's really, really slow developing and you guys might hate it and throw tomatoes and stuff like that. But this, so, so that might take up to 10 minutes, but I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna give you guys another, <laughs> another love story. And I'm gonna explain something about where I'm from. I'm from the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. I'm on the north end of the reservation, this community called Star School. Tiny place, tiny place. And my mom was a teenage parent as often happens where I come from. She had a child at 14 years old. That's not even exceptional. Kids grow up fast. My sisters, both my sisters, were teenage parents. And so, God bless, you know, they're great parents, they're great lives, they've done cool stuff, but it creates hardships. And so my mom said, fuck that, you're not gonna be a teenage parent. So my mom practiced what I call birth control by relation. <laughs> Within this small community, she told me that everybody was my cousin. <laughs> and, and so that puts you in an uncomfortable position, like you're getting ready to do something and then like, oh, that's your cousin. <laughs> and I'm not that smart, but I started to notice. <laughs> I started to notice a trend. Why is it only the attractive girls that are my cousins? And so this piece is called Cousins. I'm gonna read it to you. Uh, do you guys mind if I read? Is that cheating? Okay, it's called Cousins. And um, it's about this, this fucked up situation. And, We love to play vicious games of spin the bottle. Or you'd simply smile and punch me. In return, I try to trip you and kick you, rush and sickle and tickle, figure four leg lock, and sometimes maybe I'd succeed a little. But you were so much stronger than me back then. So you'd quickly pin me to the ground and tickle me till I cried or peed. <laughs> that was embarrassing. <laughs> Remember, we used to think that we were first cousins. Heck, we had the same last name and our parents were always together. So we played tetherball and did Easter egg hunts. Your mom was my auntie. Did you guys ever have somebody like that? Yeah, I think everybody did. Your dad was my uncle. He was also big brother, dictator, and policeman always watching us sadly. Remember that time he caught us smooching lips in the pantry? You said, I'm madly in love with him, daddy. Grab my hand proudly. He got madder and whooped both of us badly. He said, don't you ever touch your cousin like that again. <laughs> it took us many years to discover that we weren't cousins at all. In, in fact, we're not even related. <laughs> our last names are a horrible coincidence. As babies, we kissed a lot. Therefore, our parents told us we were cousins to keep us separated. But your grandma, your beautiful grandma, she spilled the beans to you one weekend when she was giving you a perm and you vacated her premises so quickly, hair still in rollers, you were just elated, ran over to my house ready to run off to Vegas, or at least hold hands publicly. We're not cousins anymore, cousin. Now we can get married.
You were about 14 then, and that's about the time that your parents sent you off to Chamawa. Chamawa, for you guys that don't know, is a boarding school in Oregon. And me being this very, very Oedipian son that wanted to get under the protective, get out of the protective gaze of my mom and my sisters, I couldn't wait to go there to get away and maybe get some booty. You know, you never know. And straight, because they're not going to be my cousins, right? <laughs> You cried the night before your long Greyhound bus ride. You sighed, lips swollen from crying, and told me we barely ever kissed. That time in the pantry doesn't count, cousin. We were barely even six. You brushed your tear-soaked salty lips over my quivering bottom lip. One hand squeezing my cheeks, the other hand on my hip. You moved your mouth down my neck. I knew that something was amiss. My stomach twisted in knots. Eyes scrunched shut. You promised that you'd leave me with something to miss. I got tense. You told me to relax. You breathed inelegantly on my Adam's apple. You said your sister showed her boyfriend that she loved him just like this. And it hurt a little bit when you did it. You bit my neck. I felt you sucking in my skin. <laughs> Pulled away, ouch, but it was too late to resist. I rubbed the raised skin filled with blood. Ow, when you were done. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> Now, let me tell you, hickeys have a special place in native romance. <laughs> this is educational right here, right? This is an educational facility. I don't know what the significance is or where the genesis of that is, but in native romance, hickey, you don't truly love somebody until they got a hickey. And I like to consider myself multilingual in Hickey. I'm from the Blackfeet Indian Reservation by way of the Nisqually Reservation, by way of the Suquamish Reservation, which is in Washington State. I spoke many, many dialects of Hickey. <laughs> then I went to a school in Kansas called Haskell Indian Nations University. And it was cosmopolitan hickeys. It was Oklahoma hickeys and Florida hickeys and hickeys from all, I didn't speak those languages. It was amazing. They were doing cursive letters. <laughs> it was like Bob Ross, you know, the white dude with the afro. <laughs> you would see from one side, and then all of a sudden, oh, shit, that's a picture. <laughs> so just a little educational FYI. <laughs> You told me to look in the mirror. Oh, wow, it's so red. How am I going to hide this from mom? You told me, you don't hide true love, cousin. <laughs> and I won't hide it either. Give me one, two, dark red. I gave you two because I thought I messed up the first time. <laughs> they look like the number eight. We were worn out, didn't know what was supposed to happen next. We just embraced. You laid your head on my chest, and we both fell asleep. It was so late. Later than we ever stayed up together in our lives, I held my pee all night because I didn't want to stop cuddling. <laughs> the next morning, when I woke up to go to the bathroom, you were gone. I wrote you every other day, and you wrote me immediately after. The first letters you sent were filled with the scent of Aquanet. I could smell your desire to come back home. <laughs> My letters were filled with butterflies, nervous energy. You tied my stomach in knots. I told you about my first week of class at my new school, but couldn't tell you my happiest thoughts. The doodling on my science book, me plus you equals a lot. My romantic flights of fancy, unrealistic fantasies that are fastened to my brain. You come home for spring break and you never go back again. And your daddy doesn't look at our hand holding with complete disdain and looks of pain. Your next letters told me all about your new friends and all the sounds that you would hear in the middle of the night through your brick dorm walls, how you were scared at night. You cried the whole first two weeks, but then those sounds became normal. They became the sounds of home. I sent you a tape to help you conquer your fear. It was a Maxell 120 minute tape, everything on it from Maxwell to Tears for Fears. <laughs> you guys remember though. <laughs> You said, I played that cassette out, cousin. Thank you so much, dear. It got me through the night. When the songs played, I could hear you singing loud and clear. And now, I'm comfortable here. In fact, you were so comfortable that the school year wasn't enough. At the end of May, you decided to stay, get ready for volleyball. We hadn't seen each other in nine months. 
Phone cards were too expensive. We only spoke once. I felt like I was losing you, cousin. I was desperate to have my cousin back. We hadn't written in two years. I hear you're coming back to the res. It doesn't sound like you'll be back at Chamawa from what your daddy says. Senior year, we'll be here. Forrest and Jenny again. I'm glad. I'm nervous. I'm mad. I'm stoked. We haven't spoke. I feel forgotten. I'm jealous, and I'm not going to your little welcome home party. Mom, I don't want to go. Ten minutes later, I found myself in the backseat of Mom's car, soaking and pouting when we arrived at your house. The door was open. It was May and sunny. You poked your head out the door and smiled at me. I couldn't help but to smile, too. I tried to hide it. I smiled larger. I put my chin down to conceal my zeal. I didn't realize I'd be this excited. I can't believe this moment's real. We're fi you're finally home, and we're finally together, and we're finally old enough to talk about forever without someone saying, they're just little kids. They don't know any better. Finally, unabashedly, without fear of your ba father bashing my skull, I can show you how happy I am to see you. I flash the cheesiest, most sincere smile I own. You step fully into the doorway. I step to meet you in an embrace. Happy to see me, too. You said, thank you so much for coming to my place. I saw your figure, your belly protruding. You must have seen the confused look on my face. Nobody told you, cousin, this is my baby shower. <laughs> Five minutes? Okay. You guys like that? Okay. Um, I'm going to do uh, one more. And this one is just uh, kind of a, a piece that um, is it, more of a, a contemporary piece. The other ones try to really, really explain to primarily non native audiences, like some of the more internal stuff. You know, everybody, once again, if you go to the Gathering Nations, you can see the feathers. You can see the Indians acting extra Indian for the, you know, non natives. And that's cool. But this is some of the little inside. This is the, 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 the farts in the middle of the night that nobody sees. <laughs> and, 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 and it's the cool stuff. This one right here. She knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I had a dream of a beautiful woman. And when she stripped off her dress, in the place of her stomach was a casket and bottles of arsenic for breasts. Her face was magnificently featured, skin that nature smiled upon and God blessed. She was a bronze colored dime that reeked of death. I woke up in a cold sweat. That was an odd dream. I thought nothing more about it, just got up and went to work. It was Friday in the winter, and like usual, my man Jay hit me up right around noon. Yo kid, you ready for tonight? 10 o'clock comes around soon. That's really how he talks. I know you got your hot fit ready to make the lady swoon, but I got mine too, purple label, Ferragamo, my hair freshly groomed. <laughs> I said, you know this, man. I'll hit you back in a little while. I went about my job at Spacely Sprockets, this mindless nine to five. I find this work so unrewarding, I make a living at the cost of being alive. Type 5,000 words, drink coffee, defrag my hard drive. I can't even focus on this stuff I'm just thinking about tonight. Got off work. Drove home, my studio castle awaits. To lift weights and watch TV and wait for my Friday night de date with destiny. Yeah, child, I don't want no scrubs tonight. I just want somebody to rub me the right way. I want her face cute and her body tight, stacked like the New York Yankees or the Miami Heat. Hit this little hot mommy off on the first night. Do the same thing again next week. <laughs> That's right, call me a player, player. Creed cologne on my clothing, Navia lotion on my face, jump in the BM 10 p.m. My den of debauchery awaits, and we're just scanning the crowd, and the music's crazy loud, and my man Jay's over there at the bar talking to some chick, one that I don't think he'll be particularly proud of when he wakes up in the morning and he rubs his eyes like a little kid, and he looks over at the young lady in horror and wonders about the horrible things that he did. But that's not for now. For now, we're a night at the Roxbury with Melanie. <laughs> My adrenaline is pumping. At 11 o'clock, I bump into this little Latina who's shaking her backside so fly that I provide her with whatever drink she wishes. <laughs> Grey Goose and Remy, my alcohol game is vicious. Now she says she wishes for her and I to be alone. Of course, that's not a thing. I type some letters into my phone. Jay, I'm out. 
You know how I do. Gave pounds to my boys as I walked out the club. <laughs> Y'all also know how I do. <laughs> Went home. You know what happened? We both had a wonderful time that night. True story. Both did, not just me. <laughs> Said we'd stay in contact. Of course we didn't. We had nothing in common. I just see her from time to time at the club. Then one night, about three months later, I can't really be sure because the weekend's kind of blurred, but on a different night at a different club, we danced together and I ended up going back home with her. And in the morning when we got dressed and we got ready to tell each other our lies that we would call each other and that we just busy, she looked at me and she started to cry. I said, what's wrong, baby? She explained that she had met this other guy and she did the same thing that she did with me, went home with him that same night. I said, that's none of my business. I, I don't want to know that. I don't judge you. And plus, we're just having fun, right? And she told me to shut up, and then she went on. She said she went with him outside to go walk out to the ride. And she knew he'd been drinking too much, but he lived just a short ride from the club, and so she was sure that it would be OK. But then when he began to drive, he hit a small patch of black ice on the road, and the car began to slide and smacked into a telephone pole. Bumps and bruises, minor bleeding. Thank God they were all right. But she decided to go to the doctor because the pain inside would not subside. And the doctor said, let me take a look inside. And got a confused look on his face and said, this cannot be right. Ma'am, did you know you were pregnant? I hate to tell you this, but your baby died. And then she looked at me with these big bloodshot eyes and said, that baby was yours. And I had a dream of a beautiful woman. And when she stripped off her dress, in the place of her stomach was a casket and bottles of arsenic for breasts. Her face was magnificently featured, skin that nature smiled upon and God blessed. She was a bronze colored dime that reeked of death. Thank you. Yeah.